time. The endless river, transporting some, engulfing others. A stream upon which information explodes, communications multiply, technology accelerates into ever new life. Yet the flow of time is constant. 60 seconds every minute, 60 minutes every hour, 24 hours every day. How then can we even keep up to do more, be more, live more completely within the same non-expandable framework of time? Perhaps one answer. Find better ways to track and use the time we have to better take our own measure, to better make use of ourselves. But if time is the measure of man, what might be the ultimate measure of time itself? American Revolution. The place, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The time, now. The goal, to find and use the most advanced technology on earth to create the most accurate, most rugged, most reliable, easiest to use wrist timepiece anyone can own. Begin with the beat of time itself. The oscillation of a quartz crystal. 32,768 times a second. A frequency that will be controlled to guarantee an accuracy within 60 seconds a year. But each quartz crystal is unique. Its frequency differing slightly from every other crystal. How then achieve the accuracy required? First, each crystal is deliberately aged, put into life cycle for two weeks to stabilize. Then, its actual frequency is measured and the direction and degree of desired performance noted. Meanwhile, laser beams are cutting apart the resistance networks that will be used to regulate each crystal. Each one, a network of 50 tantalum nitrate resistors, the most stable resistance material known. Each network evaporated onto a ceramic substrate one of the few materials able to withstand the heat of vaporization and connected with gold conductors. Subsequently, two trimmer condensers are added so that each pulsar can be adjusted at the factory and by the local jeweler to fulfill over its entire life the extraordinary accuracy guaranteed to its owner. But how can the oscillations of a quartz crystal be transformed into the exact date, day of the month, hour, minute, second? The need? A computer, highly sophisticated, multifunctional, yet small enough to easily fit on your wrist. The solution, a logic chip, so small, its production and testing can be viewed satisfactorily only under a microscope, yet containing the equivalent of more than 1,500 solid-state devices. A logic chip that can compute and store the exact time and date, that can divide the frequency of the quartz crystal into the number of impulses actually needed. The electrical properties of each logic chip are carefully measured so that each chip can be precisely mated to the one quartz crystal that will ensure optimum performance. The pulses of electrical energy are now ready to activate a readable display. What is the best possible way to display the time? Without ambiguity, without noise. Direct reading numbers that clearly, unmistakably communicate the time with a precision that matches the accuracy of pulsar. 
numbers large enough to be easily read, direct reading numbers at least one-eighth inch high. And the best way to produce these numbers? Light-emitting diodes, a bright, highly visible, active display with a design life of more than 100 years of continuous use, which means they can never burn out, never grow dim within your lifetime and lifetimes thereafter. But to read out equally well in daylight or darkness, at what intensity should the diodes be set? Actually, there's no one brightness that can work equally well in any light. The answer? A unique photo sensor, only in pulsar, to continuously monitor the ambient light, the light falling on your wrist, so that if the light increases, it can continuously and automatically command more power from the batteries to increase the intensity of the display so that to the eye the apparent brightness remains the same over a wide range of lighting conditions. Even when the batteries are down, special circuits maintain an even level of brightness in the individual LED segments. And the total diode display is completely encapsulated in a lens of epoxy for maximum protection and better visibility. Every single one checked against reference standards for uniformity, brightness, display, and aesthetic value. But how do you prevent unwanted light from entering Pulsar and being reflected back to the viewer, thus obscuring the numbers? By covering the light display with a unique time screen, Actually, a sharp cut filter of a very limited bandwidth that passes only the red light of the diodes and prevents unwanted reflection. The time screen is a specially hardened, highly tempered, highly resistant glass, fired like Pyrex, that cannot be discolored by sunlight or ultraviolet, and is at least three times the thickness of ordinary watch crystals. Virtually unbreakable sealed with epoxy, a permanent bond that will not shrink, change shape, or come out. Now, if you were designing the ultimate timepiece, what kind of case would you put it in? Perhaps you too would use only the finest materials available today. Stainless steel, 80 micron thick 14 karat gold filled, and 14 karat solid gold. A unique beveled design integrating case and bracelet into one of the most distinctive works of the jeweler's art. As beautiful to wear and look at as it is to use. For each case is factory sealed to guarantee water resistance and is thoroughly tested to an underwater depth of 100 feet. A sealed case with no openings to violate its integrity. How then is Pulsar powered? And how do you set the time and make it go? The power. Two silver oxide power cells made especially for Pulsar. Each slightly larger and more powerful than those used in other electronic timepieces. Power cells that will last a year or more in normal use. Of as many as 25 readouts a day yet can be replaced in just two minutes by any Pulsar jeweler. With the batteries in place and the case sealed, only one final act is needed to put this extraordinary time computer into operation. On either side of the date command Pulsar, a command button, one for the time, one for the date. But push either one and you're in for an unusual experience. For unlike any other button you've ever pushed, these don't push anything else into action. Rather, they're part of a unique precision-engineered activating system that you'll find only as a component of Pulsar. Press the button, and you're really pushing against a million life cycle spring whose only job is to return the button to its original position. What does the work is a small platinum cobalt magnet at the end of the command button. Bring this precisely charged magnet a measured distance nearer to the sealed module, and it swiftly closes 
a hermetically sealed reed switch within the module to release the power cell's energy to the LED display to give you a readout. Magnetic reed switches that can open and close a million times and more, four of them in all. And because the action is entirely magnetic, there are no holes in the sealed inner case to violate the integrity of Pulsar. For the traveler, it's great to change the hour as you move across time zones without in any way changing the precise setting of minutes and seconds. Here then is the ultimate timepiece, able to read out the time in the light of day or the dark of a moonless night, to feel the shock of a pounding surf, the savage twist of a racket, or the catch of a lateral pass without pausing for a moment. In this age of on the go, it's nice to know there's a timepiece that'll go as far and for as long as you will. The world's first solid state wrist time computer, now with date command, to read out the month and day, indicate morning and night. Through the new technology of time, a whole new order of performance. A performance that achieves the ultimate inaccuracy. The date, computed automatically for every month of the year, including leap year. The time, accurately computed to within 60 seconds a year, many times the accuracy of tuning fork and other mechanical devices. The ultimate in ruggedness. Each and every component modularized in highly sophisticated protected packages. The entire module cushioned in silicon, black top to add water protection and minimize reflection. Water resistant, down to a hundred feet below. Shock resistant, because there are no moving parts. The ultimate in reliability. No moving parts. No balance wheel, gears, motors, springs, tuning forks, hands, stems, or knobs to wind up, run down, or wear out. Every significant component, 100% tested before assembly. The entire timepiece tested and run for two weeks so that each unit achieves Pulsar performance before shipment unconditionally guaranteed for three years with a life expectancy except for case wear and batteries of more than 50 years. The ultimate in easy, carefree use. With no moving parts, there's no routine maintenance, no oiling, cleaning, checking, and the information you want is precisely what you get. Direct, easy reading of the time or the date exactly in the light of day or dark of night the ultimate timepiece. A lifetime of the most accurate, rugged, reliable, carefree service you can put on your wrist. If time is the measure of man, here is the ultimate measure of time itself. And tomorrow, the quest for excellence is never ending. Even now, you are being brought closer than you may know to the very edge of time. Jack Benny will be out in just a moment. Roberta Peters, uh, Rene Aubergenois, and uh, Milton Macklin with that exciting film with the Savages from New Guinea. Uh, fortunately, this is something we want to show you quickly because I understand they're going to make a press announcement on this tomorrow. From time to time we show new products, but this is wild. It's a, it's a wristwatch, and it happens to be made by the uh, Hamilton Watch Company and Pulsar. Oh. And uh, <coughs> it's the first, they say, first computer program to tell time. And it has no moving parts. And it's a digital. You ever seen a, you've seen a digital alarm mm. clock, right? Yes. Now, watch the monitor. I'm going to have to hold this up. And I'm going to have to shade it so you can see. Okay, now take a close look first. Okay, you see that? Now, I've got to shade it. You see this little button here? Now, watch what happens. 
o'clock, it's upside down. Oh. <laughs> That's the first Can I problem. I shield it for you. No, this right. way. Now watch. You press it. Those are the seconds. 59, right? Oh. And now it goes, it goes dark. You press it again. 649, 0, 1, 2, 3. Oh, that's Counts up the seconds. If you take it off, it goes blank. 650 and 9 seconds. 10, right? Is that wild? Oh, that's going to sell. That must have taken That'll off. sell. The machine finally put Mickey Mouse out of work. Now, that's weird, isn't it? Oh, I like that. Uh, that is, uh, will sell for, I guess we can mention this, right? It uh, will be available for consumers next year. will sell for $1,500. The watch also will tell you the exact moment that you went bankrupt. <laughs> we just thought you might like to see that. Interesting. Great. Okay. When I first went to California from uh, the Midwest, you know, Mr. Berge, it must be exciting to be uh, right in on the beginnings of an industry that is changing the face of the world as far as time-telling is concerned. It's not only very exciting, it's very uh, gratifying to see an idea uh, come forth and uh, cause a kind of timing revolution, if you will. Well, it seems since uh, men stopped turning over hourglasses and referring to sundials that this has been... Uh, mainly a, a, a European-dominated industry, and more recently by the Swiss. Uh, uh, what sort of concern do you see from your colleagues on that side of the ocean? <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we, uh, it was quite a, quite a turnaround to uh, be able to uh, ship a product uh, out of this little town of Lancaster and, uh, and find that uh, the destination was Switzerland, and there were watches. Perhaps because of our space age technology and the, the foot forward that that gave us in uh, making things very, very tiny and very, very reliable, um, the United States obviously dominates the market now. To what extent does it dominate the market? In the uh, advanced timekeeping, solid state, and I would say uh, perhaps uh, three out of every four of the new solid-state watches are made in this country. Uh, this will, of course, change with time because technological leadership is not a permanent type of thing. But uh, I think it's reasonable to conclude that we have such a strong electronic techno technology base that, that as others catch up, we'll, we'll be developing new things. And uh, I believe we have a pretty long... Uh, uh, future to look forward to. Long term. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, um, to, to toss out names, at, at a very, very youthful stage of its career, the Pulsar is the Omega or the Rolex of, of uh, this new brand of timekeeping. Uh, do, do you like to make comparisons like that? Well, I think uh, uh, it's difficult, <clears throat> pardon me, to avoid it sometimes, but uh, uh, we're we uh, have been very fortunate to enjoy a position uh, in the top segment of the market, uh, which has traditionally and historically been dominated by names like Rolex. <coughs> but uh, I think we've also carved out a new market uh, with this product. That is to say, it, it seems to appeal and to serve needs that heretofore were we're not being served, and therefore, uh, I think it's safe to say that that we uh, didn't come on this thing totally by accident. Uh, it was a uh, a long, tough haul, but uh, very gratifying. Why is the <coughs> is the uh, pulsar, and why why is the digital watch? Uh, almost always adorned with names that we don't really recognize in connection with watches. It would, uh, would seem that we, we look in a jewelry store window and we see names that are, that are new. 
uh, for several reasons, I think. Uh, one reason, certainly, is that the names we have learned to recognize are from the traditional companies. Uh, you mentioned several of them. There are others uh, uh, that have taken years and years to, to impress their names upon the public. Uh, but uh, technology is no respecter of, of uh, tradition. And uh, with the marvels of the new technology, uh, it settled in places like sleepy Lancaster and uh, in uh, the West Coast where the uh, technology is very strong. So I think that that it needed a fresh start in some respects uh, in order to gain uh, a very rapid acceptance. Uh, the, the traditionalists were too concerned about maintaining their position and not sometimes concerned enough about uh, what was happening uh, up in the ivory towers. So you sound pretty convinced that uh, this is not only the watch of today, but also the watch of tomorrow. Very definitely. Uh, there are a lot of uh, projections in this matter. I happen to have my own, and uh, uh, I would say that by 1980, uh, perhaps around 22 to 24 percent of all watches sold, and there will be about 300 million of them sold that year, uh, will be solid state. I believe in the early 80s, perhaps 81 or 82, that at least half the unit volume and well over half the dollar volume will uh, be from this little seed that we planted back in 1972. Seen this, haven't you, Joe? Have you yes. seen it work? No, it, I don't know what it is. It looks like a Dick Tracy. Well, it's, it does, doesn't it? And it looks utterly blank. But this is a new thing Hamilton has brought out. The Hamilton Watch Company has a solid state wrist computer, which, when I push the button, gives you a readout. I'm going to shade that so you can see it. Yeah, I'm going to shade it. You hold it. These lights are so bright. It's, it's very easy to see, even here in the studio. But I want to see if I can televise it so well, that there, you see. Well, that's good. No, just about, there it is. Now you can now, see it. Now can you see it? Yeah, yeah, see there? Sure, there it is. 720, and, the, and holding the button down brings you the seconds. 16, 17, 18, so forth. Now, this the significant thing about this is there are no moving parts in this at all. There are no hands. This is a computer, literally, that's constantly telling the time. It isn't being, it, it doesn't read out until you demand, and you demand by, by pushing the button. And uh, a, the battery that powers it is rechargeable. It requires, the parts in it, they're, they're equivalent of about Three, almost 3,500, 3,474 transistors, mm -hmm. equivalent of transistors. It's micro-miniaturization. If this were the, done with vacuum tubes, as original computer circuitry was, it would, it would take an enormous volume, undoubtedly bigger than this desk we're sitting at. Can you set that if something... Yes. Well, first of all, how accurate is it right it, on it, huh? It, it's very accurate. They, they say within about three seconds a month, and, and it's easy to... Yeah, isn't that a rate for you? And you can, of course, set it. But it's telling the time all the time. Here's the way it was set up, even even miniaturized, but not uh, you know not with vacuum tubes, but the original kind of breadboard circuitry. If you if you take a look at this, you see this enormous amount of spaghetti here in wires circuits. This was the readout, uh, the face here, the tube. It had to be reduced to this size. Mm. See, that's the size of the watch parts. Is it? You've got the you've got the part that tells the time, the part that runs it, and the battery. Basically, three components, and there's a crystal that. Uh, that is what uh, keeps it so amazingly How about accurate. temperature change? Well, the temperature change will affect any timepiece, and it'll affect any crystal. Shall we take a look at it? How much? Can I buy one now? Give you no, it'll, be, it'll be available next year. It'll be $1,500. 1500 Yeah, but it's a, it's a new thing. We'll take a station. Decades, this stately building along the Columbia Avenue in Lancaster was the home of America's greatest contribution to the watch industry. Those who owned a Hamilton said it was not only an excellent timepiece, but it showed good taste. Hamilton was the official timepiece for the nation's railroads in days when trains did run on time. Today, this is HMW Industries and the home of the most sought-after timepiece in the world, the Pulsar Time Computer.
A push of a button or a flick of the wrist gives its owner the time and the date in bright red numerals. The first Pulsar was marketed in 1972. It sold for $2,100. Today, depending on your taste, Pulsars range from under $300 up. From a modest beginning three and a half years ago, Pulsar has grown to a $25 million a year business. The man behind the Pulsar is 41-year-old John Berge, who 16 years ago began work for the Hamilton Watch Company as an engineer. We were looking for a rather innovative way to, uh, to keep track of and to display time, and uh, things weren't too good at the time, so we decided to leapfrog ahead of what everybody else was doing. So we came up with Pulsar. How does Pulsar work? What is it? What makes it different from any other timepiece on the market? It has a, uh, uh, a quartz crystal time base, which for the non-technical people among us uh, is a vibrating piece of quartz which breaks down a second into 32,768 equal parts each second. And from there on we count down with computer circuitry and so forth to, to time out a very precise time. When Pulsar was first introduced, its critics called it a fluke, an overnight whim, a fad that would rapidly die away. John Berge answers his critics by saying the production of three and a half million Pulsars a year can hardly be called a fluke or a fad, but rather the acceptance of a new and unique timepiece. In fact, this past year, a number of Pulsar imitators have hit the market. The future is very bright. Uh, not only have we penetrated the international market, and now you can buy pulsars and fine retail jewelers all over the world. But in a product sense, the future is very exciting. I think it's limited only by our own imagination. Uh, that is, some of the products we either nearly have or will have they're in the drawing board are extremely exciting. The Pulsar Time Computer, another product manufactured here in central Pennsylvania and marketed throughout the world. From HMW Industries in Lancaster, I'm Dick Hawksworth. Well, one view of the human condition is that you can measure the onset of unease from the moment when we all started caring about knowing exactly what time it is. Nowadays, of course, just about everybody goes around worrying about what time it is so they know when to go to work or to lunch or whatever. And that brings us to the wristwatch. Once considered sissified, the wristwatch didn't achieve respectability until the First World War when men in the trenches found it handier than pulling out a pocket watch every time they had to synchronize an attack. But look at the wristwatch now. The wristwatch. Over 200 million will be sold worldwide this year. 50 million in the U.S. alone. The majority have the traditional face and hands and Swiss-made movements. But a surprising number are the new American-made digital type, now available under about 50 different brand names. Their arrival is causing a revolution in the American watch industry, which in recent years has been virtually wiped out by Swiss competition. I think it's, uh, it's ironic that uh, the Swiss people that put us out of business and uh, because of cheap labor in Switzerland and killed our industry. Now we are making watches here in the United States and they're buying the watches we're making here. And we see a great future. The first digital watch, the Pulsar, was developed three years ago by Time Computer Incorporated from the technology that produced the pocket calculator. At its Lancaster, Pennsylvania plant where American workers assemble the tiny semiconductor integrated circuits the vibrating quartz crystals, and the light-emitting diodes called LEDs, none of them mechanical moving parts, TCI President John Berge is optimistic about the future of the digital. I see a very bright future for the digital watch in the United States. I think that by perhaps 1980, we can look forward to some 25 million units a year being produced. Next door at the Hamilton Watch Company, where both digitals and standard watches are assembled, there's still confidence in the future of the old style. We find there's still a continuing demand and that there are a lot of people who, where they get somewhat excited about an LED watch, a solid state watch, they still want uh, the old uh, traditional watch that uh, 
has the usual face on it with the hands and the numbers, etc. And uh, as long as they get an accurate timepiece, there's always going to be a demand. The big jump in digital watch sales this year, they're up as much as 200%, has to do with price. Many brands, especially those made by the electronic companies, are now being sold close to the price of the cheapest regular watches. And industry analyst Sal Accardo thinks the price will go even lower. I think uh, probably by Christmas of uh, 76, you'll see digital watches priced as low as uh, $30. Perhaps uh, two years out, uh, you'll be able to buy a digital watch in the price range of $15 or $20 where it competes uh, head-on with the Timex uh, watch business. I think that's what it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be that type of business, particularly. The clock and the wristwatch with hands may never totally disappear like the sundial of old. But the digital watch revolution this year has told this once staid old industry that times are changing and, in fact, will never be quite the same again. Mitchell Krause, CBS News, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. This is Judy Rick with a gift for a man who has almost everything except a $4,000 watch. And there's one Christmas president, present President Ford definitely won't find under his own Christmas tree, and Judy Licht explains. Recently, Betty Ford was asked by reporters if the president had told her what he wanted as a Christmas president, and she said yes. He saw a watch advertised in the newspaper, and this is it. The $3,950 18-karat gold Pulsar wrist calculator. It's manufactured by the HMW Corporation in a limited gift edition of 100 and carried at only a handful of stores. Lambert Brothers is one. Mr. Markman, what can it do? Well, Jerry, in addition to being a regular calculator that tells the time by pressing it once, that tells the date by pressing it two times, and that reads out the seconds by pressing it three times, this is a memory calculator. It can add, it can subtract, it can divide, it can figure percentages. For instance, if you wanted to figure $6,000, 6, divided by 35, you'll get the answer like that. You use this tool, which has a nylon tip. The other side is a uh, ballpoint pen that can be used for writing. The watch calculator has been one of the runaway successes of this Christmas gift season. Even the manufacturer told us he was surprised by the sales. Because of the demand, another 100 will be manufactured after Christmas. At Lambert Brothers, where mostly women are buying the watches, they can't keep up with the demand. We have a waiting list, which will go on for quite a while, I imagine, until we can get a new supply. Have you ever heard anything sell this well? Or is, nope. it is this typical? No, frankly, this is not typical. This is a much greater response than we've ever had before. For any item? For any item in the store. It, it is primarily due to the fact that it is so very different. You think that that's why people are willing to spend $4,000 for what? Well, I think they're getting something that's very unusual, and for the person that has everything, I think it's a marvelous gift. And uh, all I can tell you is that I wish we had more here right now. Although President Ford said he wanted the watch, Betty Ford told reporters when she took one look at the price, she laughed and said, no way. But don't worry, Mr. President and any other viewers who may be interested in the watch. In the late spring, we're promised there'll be a bargain stainless steel version for a mere $600. From Lambert Brothers on Madison Avenue, this is Judy Rick reporting. Inviting you to join Johnny and his guest, Shecky Green, Ted Knight, Ethel Berman, and Madeline Rue. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's Johnny. I'm glad to hear that. No, because that's, that is not Christmas. Give me a tree. Real tree. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Did you see this in the paper? The first family is getting ready for Christmas, and Betty Ford was decorating the Christmas tree, and the press asked her what the president wanted for Christmas. And Betty Ford said that Gerald Ford asked for a digital watch. But this is not your run-of-the-mill digital watch. The price is $3,000. And Betty Ford said that was out of the question. Three times. It's not that the expense for the watch that she minded, but it was the 
expense of the lessons teaching the president how to use it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> president's very budget conscious, though. They ask him what he wanted for Christmas, and the president says, all I want for Christmas is Ronald Reagan's two front teeth, which I thought was... <laughs> The, uh, the president has a watch. It's, a, uh, it's an old watch. It's a Timex. And he got it for doing a commercial with John Cameron Swayze. Uh, what they did, they tied the watch to Ford's head <laughs> at the top of an airplane stairway. <laughs> it was a hell of a test. Uh, Ronald Reagan told his wife what he wanted for Christmas. He's more conservative. He wanted a digital sundial. <laughs> They don't make. Do you know where the first president is going to spend Christmas? He is going skiing in Vail, Colorado. The reason he's going out there, he just read the latest Gallup polls, and he figures as long as he's going downhill, he might as well do it on snow. <laughs> uh, well, enough of that. Woo! No, we're not doing Okay, reindeer breath, I'll tell you what, we've, uh, <laughs> uh, shopping is tough this year, you know, for people. It is always this thing to find out the right thing for the right person and so forth. And um, we have, uh, from time to time, people send us items that obviously they would like to be shown on the Tonight Show, and we pick some out that we think you might find interesting. These are all legitimate. These are not made up. Uh, some of them are crazy, some of them are practical. So would you like to go over with yes, me at the desk and I'll, I'll show you some of the new things. Is my gift over here, perchance? What? My gift. Okay. What do we have here? Good. Now we have... We'll take a break, then we're going to show you a watch that does a lot of different things. Makes hot waffles, presses clothes. We'll take a short break. Okay, if you just join us, we're showing some uh, rather unusual Christmas gifts. If you read the paper the other day, this was the watch that President Ford said he wanted for Christmas, and Mrs. Ford said it was out of the question because it cost $3,950. It's 18 karat solid gold. It's a limited edition and numbered. It comes with a little gold-filled pen, and I'll show you what you use that for. This is the, from the Pulsar Watch and Calculator from the Pulsar Company of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Now, you can see this. Well, what they can do with miniaturization out there, you press the first time, and you get the time, right? 6.01 here. Press it again, you get the date. 12.18, right? Press it again, and you get the seconds. Press it again, it goes right back to time, date, seconds. Now, if you take this and press the little, this comes with a little stylus on the end, the zero, you now have a calculator, which gives you plus, minus, subtracts, divides, percentage, and everything. All in here, for example, let's take 78, right? Uh, and let's add, right? Plus 59, and you press that over here, and you press the equals thing, and it comes up 137. So in other words, you can do percentages on here, calculate, add, divide, percentages, all, wow. all in this watch. Is that wild? Ooh. How much again, 39? $3,950 for a watch. If you got that much money, you don't have to be on time anywhere. <laughs> Actually, the secret of this is, most people don't know this, there's a little teeny Japanese accountant in here. <laughs> a little, little, little back. That's made by the Pulsar uh, Watch Company of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Okay. 